I'm sure we're all kind of aware, but it's a little bit more straightforward to diagnose an infection. I think the tricky part of things comes when we have to diagnose things that aren't clear-cut infections, and so that brings us to what we're going to talk about today uh, with things that can mimic an infectious process uh, but really aren't. We're often tasked with diagnosing just about all of these different things that come up. But in the process of coming up with this whole topic, it, it got me to think about all the other specialties that there are in at least internal medicine and what we call them. So we, we know that someone who specializes in gastrointestinal diseases is called a gastroenterologist. Cardiovascular disease, it's a cardiologist. Hematologist, oncologist for hematologic and oncologic diseases, rheumatologist, allergist, so on and so on. Even if you're in the essentially the intensive care unit, we call those people intensivists. But what do we call us, really? And we don't really have a, a clear-cut name that we can label ourselves. We really have a whole bunch of names, if you think about it. We have an infectious disease specialist. You can be an HIV AIDS specialist. I didn't include this. You can be a TB specialist. We, we can be a syphilologist, which is the first recognized medical specialty of all things. In fact, it's one of the first recognized medical journals uh, along with other STDs. You can be an infectologist, is what I think they call infectious disease specialists overseas, a virologist, and a microbiologist. Now, I know that's a special field in itself, but you know, technically we're, we're microbiologists also. And it got me to think, with all these different hats, should we really call ourselves not really an infectious disease specialist, but kind of a specialist in diagnostic medicine, because that's what we kind of do. We diagnose things that other people can't, which led me to, to this. So I'm sure you're all aware of this show. Dr. House is in charge of the Department of Diagnostic Medicine, which does not exist. There's no such thing. Technically, that's all of medicine. But if you also remember, if you're not familiar with this, this screenshot, this is House, Gregory House. And he, one of his specialties was in infectious disease. And essentially, a lot of the weird diagnoses that they make on the show is, is infectious disease related, along with neurologic diseases, uh, which leads us to all these diagnostic conundrums that we have to solve. When we talk about a topic as broad as an infectious disease mimic, how do we really know what direction to go down to? We can look at things that mimic an infection like a granuloma, and there's a whole bunch of things that can cause that or other types of pulmonary nodules. So uh, we have to narrow this down somehow. So one of the big things that's involved with infectious disease is the aspect of, of fever. So I thought that's an initial starting point that we can use and focus this presentation on. Uh, if, if you all aren't familiar with William Osler, this is one of the, the quotes that he, he was famously uh, known for. Humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible, is fever, which is reason enough to, to talk about this a little bit more. But before we delve into it a little bit more in detail, I want to take us back to the 1800s. It's always helpful to put things into some kind of historic context. So back in the 1800s, there was a lot of events taking place, both infectious, medical, and non-medical. You have the Battle of Waterloo. Let me see if this came up. Yep, Battle of Waterloo. We have the father of auscultation, Linnaeus. We have steamships going across the Atlantic. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution was founded. We have essentially quite a bit more. Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876. We have a uh, Florence Nightingale appearing on the scene. Darwin published Origin of Species. So it's a pretty busy time. So in, in this whole context, we come across one particular figure, and that's this individual. I'm sure it's, it's going to be tough, but does anyone know who this person is? No? This is Carl Reinhold August Wunderlich. It's either Wunderlich, Wunderlich, so pardon me if I'm saying that incorrectly. He is credited as being the father of clinical thermometry. Actually, the first thermometer was possibly created by Galileo. He used a, an alcohol-based solution to create these thermometers. But as time went on, no one really knew what to do with these thermometers and how we can actually use them clinically. So he came on the scene and is credited to really come across some of the major uh, findings about how we can apply 
thermometry to clinical practice. And just to put things in more, more of a context, these are a lot of the figures that were around during his time. I'm sure, you, I think you guys recognize just about everyone on this list. We have Lister, we have Koch, Ludwig, Pasteur, Brown, Soquard, back in your neurology days, uh, Linnaic. So, I mean, this is a pretty contentious time for uh, medicine and quite interesting too. And just to, to, to show you how uh, involved the whole medical community was, does anyone know who this person is? It's the orange arrow pointing to the person on the top left. That's uh, Virchow. Virchow's triad. So Wunderlich and this guy were kind of professional enemies. They would, they would try to argue with each other um, publicly and in literature. So it, it was a pretty busy time for medicine. So what did this guy do? So he reportedly, in, in this book, The Course of Temperature and Diseases, published in 1868, poorly analyzed 1 million axillary temperature readings from 25,000 individuals. And he found that a mean temperature was 98.6. And it ranges also based on the time of day. And anything more than 100.4 was considered, quote unquote, suspicious. Is there something else going on? So 1868 with axillary temperatures, we still use these numbers now, 100.4 and 98.6. So this was a, a, a big study that we still have profound impacts from. But the whole question about a, what a normal temperature is is still a bit contested. So th this guy, Mac Makowiak, he wrote this article on uh, this guy. And in this article, if you take a look at it, he speaks so highly of him, but he just didn't really know if this work was true or not. So he did one for himself, and he analyzed 700 temperature readings from 148 individuals. And there was a variation between what a normal temperature is and what time of the day it's taken, uh, and in, if you're based on uh, gender also. So the mean oral temperature that he noted was 98.2. And the range can go anywhere from 98.9 to 99.9. .9. Um, and, and this was, I don't believe this was an axillary thermometer. I think this was an oral thermometer too. So we still have variable definitions about what a fever is uh, and what a normal temperature is. But just kind of going over some basic definitions, a uh, pyrexia or fever is really your body's response to something happening and in kind of an alarm sign that there's something going on that should be addressed. Um, hyperthermia, however, is something pathologic. It's something going on in your body that isn't associated with that hypothalamic set point. Uh, it can often go above 41 degrees Celsius. Uh, and if you look at a lot of literature, they define a real fever as something that's greater than 100.9 or 38.3 degrees Celsius. We use different temperatures here every once in a while with 100.4, going back to Wunderlich's first study. Um, so it really depends on what we classify a fever as, and that, that unfortunately isn't as clear cut as, as maybe we would like for it to be. So the normal temperature um, also varies depending on where you take it. So a rectal temperature is about a degree Fahrenheit higher than oral temperature. It varies based on your respiratory rate. Uh, and if you really want to do it right, so the patient shouldn't really eat, drink, or smoke 15 minutes prior to an oral temperature. So good luck at the VA for getting a, a regular temperature. Uh, and if you really want to do it right and get an axillary temperature, you got to lie still, keep the arms tight, and wait exactly 10 minutes. That's, that's how you theoretically should do it. And this is from uh, Sapira's Art and Science of the Bedside Diagnosis. So if you haven't read that book, it's kind of an internist guide to the physical exam. Uh, and then something interesting that they also notice is what happens when you have a, a factitious fever. He says, oh, obviously get a rectal temperature. But if, if that's not possible, you can measure the temperature of the urine as it's coming out. And if you have an oral temperature of 38, you have an expected urine temperature of 37.3. So there's really not a lot of ways you can fake that. Um, and they have these normograms that are available to help come up with what they correspond to. So just very briefly what a fever is and what a mechanism of fever really comes up to. So you have thermoreceptors located everywhere in your body. Uh, you also have thermosensors in the anterior hypothalamus, the preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus, uh, along with the cervical spine. And then this regulatory center, uh, which is in the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, creates your set point. 
the thermal regulatory system maintains that set point. So everywhere else in the body maintains that temperature that is set by the hypothalamus. So when you get a fever, you have these exogenous pyrogens, such as bacteria, that come into your body, activate the immune system, which secretes a lot of these endogenous pyrogens. So these pyrogens then stimulate prostaglandins, which go all the way up to the hypothalamus and helps uh, essentially modify that set point. And the whole purpose of doing that is by increasing your temperature, you have a kickstart to your immune system, creating a lot of these, auto, uh, these antibody formations, these uh, adaptive immune responses to really help fight this infection. This is kind of an illustration as to how this would look like, uh, but we're not going to go into it too much, but if you want to take a look at it, it's here. So you have this exogenous pyrogen that secretes a lot of these uh, um, substances, creating a cytokine response, then prostaglandins, and then you go all the way up to the hypothalamus to uh, uh, essentially change that set point. So that's kind of the background. Now we'll actually go into the, the real core part of all this, which is what can come up as a fever, as looking like an infection, but not really an infection. So the first of this large family of mimickers is a neoplastic fever. So we see it often, we'll see it in Moffitt all the time, we'll see it at Tampa General all the time, even Moffitt, uh, uh, or the VA I mean. So a neoplastic fever, it's a fever caused by nothing else but the underlying cancer. So you can't blame it on anything. Unfortunately, with a lot of these mimickers, you have to exclude the presence of an actual infection before you can say something else is, is a mimic. Um, so that becomes a difficult part. So you want to think you can make the diagnosis early, save all this antibiotics, save a lot of money by these diagnostic methods, but unfortunately you just can't. So it is really time intensive sometimes. So the difference between an infectious fever and a neoplastic fever is that there's more feeling of wellness essentially with the neoplastic fever. There's not as many chills, sweating, warmth, uh, and, and you don't really have any hemodynamic compromise. It doesn't really become affected by Tylenol or aspirin, uh, whereas an infectious fever has the complete opposite of all of this, and that's, that's one of the distinguishing features. But how does a neoplastic fever actually develop? So a lot of these cancer cells can actually secrete a lot of these cytokines that can be involved in developing a fever. And these cytokines can go directly to the preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. Uh, renal cell carcinomas have a lot of IL-6 which can be involved with fever generation. Lymphomas uh, can also secrete a lot of IL-6. And that may be one of the reasons why we get a lot of these B symptoms that we are often asked about. Uh, tumor necrosis factors can come up from dead tissue, and a lot of this may involve the cyclooxygenase, which can um, mediate the prostaglandin E2 synthesis pathway to develop these fevers. So you may or may not see any change with inflammatory markers. However, in an infectious fever, you do see a downward trend when you have some kind of response. This is a diagnostic criteria for a neoplastic fever, so this actually does exist if you take a look at the literature. So it's a temperature of 100.04 at least daily and over two weeks. And there's an exclusion of any other infectious cause. There's no allergic mechanisms involved and it doesn't respond to adequate antibiotic therapy for at least seven days. And interestingly enough, still a part of the neoplastic fever criteria is whether there's a response to naproxen. And this brings up the whole question of something that we all should probably know about is the naproxen test for diagnosing neoplastic fever. So there's a lot of question of whether this actually works or not work. Um, and there's some prominent actually studies that's still cited now that goes over this. So these people, Chang and Gross, came up with the, the first well-recognized studies of the utility of the naproxen test in diagnosing neoplastic fever. So this is the first one. We'll go over this quickly. So. Uh, not to fear with going over a lot of these different articles. So in this first study, they found 22 patients who couldn't really have a determined source of fever. And this was a criteria, at least one temperature of 101, point, uh, 101 degrees Fahrenheit, and a fever over one week, and no other source of infection. So of these 22 patients, 15 were on antibiotics, and they didn't have any response to therapy. These people were started on naproxen. 
you had seven of these 22 that had a very strong suspicion for a neoplastic fever. So they weren't even on any antibiotics. They went straight to naproxen. So they were given a dose, 250Q12, and they were still evaluated to make sure nothing else kind of bruised up in terms of infection. And if they responded um, within three days of the naproxen test, so they had a complete response, then therapy was extended to another seven days. So a complete lysis is when the temperature uh, improved to less than 99 degrees Fahrenheit within 24 hours uh, and sustained for more than five days. And a partial response was something a little bit short of that. So of these people, the 15 that were on antibiotics and naproxen, nine of the 15 had a complete response to naproxen. Two had a partial response. And of those two, one had a mixed connective tissue disease and one had lupus. So, I mean, could that be involved? Possibly. And then four of the 15, two had a perirectal abscess, one had an infected hippon catheter, one had an ovarian cancer with a massive tumor necrosis. So, I mean, it, it kind of points toward this being possible. Of the seven that were just on naproxen alone, five had a complete lysis and two had uh, really no response. And there was another reason why they still had these fevers. So that's kind of one. So just to make it a little bit more towards the point, they did another study, uh, still at the same hospital, and they defined a temperature of at least 101, fever of one week, and no other evidence for infection. Found 21 patients, 12 initially on antibiotics, um, and then they were started on naproxen, and then nine that were really not on any antibiotics. They had a strong suspicion from the get-go, and so they were also started on naproxen. So of these, they put them on a dose of 250Q12 treated for about three days. And if they had a complete response, then they were defined as having a lysis of fever to less than 99 degrees Fahrenheit. If they had a partial response, then they have an increase in their dose uh, to a maximum of, I think, 1,500 milligrams per day were used. So of these 21, 16 had a complete response. Uh, one of these had one recurrent temperature. Uh, and they noticed that of, of those people that actually had a response, the day that they were given these naproxens, they ended up having this strong, like, sweating diaphoretic response. Five of the 21 uh, did not have a complete response. One of these had a laparotomy, and this female had abdominal leiomyomatosis, uh, did not respond to higher doses of naproxen, and she had a laparotomy without any infection source. And then four of the remaining five had responses to higher doses of naproxen. So of these, just to kind of prove the point a little bit more, 10 patients, naproxen was discontinued. Their fever returned uh, usually within 24 hours. So it kind of points towards this actually being possible, and you can actually diagnose this based on the naproxen test. But to play the devil's advocate, there was this guy who didn't really see a big of a um, large evidence enough towards doing this uh, in clinical practice. So he had a larger patient population in general, but only 11 of these people had a neoplasm. And of these 11, Six had a positive naproxen test uh, with a 55% rate. Uh, and 33% uh, actually, yeah, 38% without a neoplasm also had the same response with uh, the naproxen test. So it begs the question whether this actually does work or not. So I'll leave it up to you and whether this can actually work or not, but it's something to consider as to whether you can diagnose a neoplastic fever with naproxen. So that's kind of one big category. The other big category of infectious disease mimics um, that we'll go into next is a central fever. So we'll see this often with a lot of uh, patients over at the neuroscience department over at Tampa General or even at the, the VA hospital for that matter. Um, so just to rehash this point because it tends to be uh, easily in one ear and out the other, you have thermoreceptors on the just about everywhere in the body uh, as well as the anterior hypothalamus along with the cervical spine and then the center establishes a set point. Uh, and then everything else maintains that set point. And then when any of this is compromised, you develop central fevers. So it has a lot of consequences. You get a lot of metabolic byproducts, you get increased oxygen consumption, acidosis, nitric oxide production, uh, a lot of glutamic acid production. Uh, you can get increased intracranial pressure from a lot of different mechanisms. Um, and unfortunately, there's no solid diagnostic criteria for central fever, but it does have uh, major characteristics. So this was published in 2017. They just went over some basic overview of what a central fever is. So anything that involves an injury to the center of thermoregulation, uh, excluding all the other causes, and it can happen within uh, about three days following a big CNS injury, 
uh, you usually see higher than normal temperature, so higher than that associated with an infection. Uh, and also really no response to antipyretic therapy and it can last for quite a bit of time. So if you get a direct trauma to the hypothalamus, uh, motor vehicle accidents, a lot of uh, traumatic brain injuries, you can see the same phenomenon of central fevers. Uh, and it's felt as if the trauma itself can release a lot of inflammatory markers that they don't really have to travel that far. They can go straight to the thermoregulatory center to cause these fevers to develop. They often happen with subarachnoid hemorrhages and can happen within even about three days after the hemorrhage itself. And if you have an intraventricular hemorrhage, it's a huge risk factor for developing central fevers. Uh, there's a lot of heme decomposition, especially in the intraventricular region, uh, with a lot of carbon monoxide production, and they go straight to, to work at the thermoregulatory center. You can see the same phenomenon with uh, acute ischemic strokes, which often are associated with central fevers too. And when you do see them with an acute ischemic stroke, uh, it tends to mark a, a poor prognosis in general. Uh, also with hemorrhagic strokes, and a lot of uh, uh, the severity of the central fever tends to be uh, proportional to whether there's an intraventricular hemorrhage and the degree of the hemorrhage seen uh, with any of this. So that's kind of one big phenomenon. But associated with this big neurologic family is a neurogenic fever. So a quadriplegic fever, which often is a term you'll see in the literature, is it's a prolonged period of hyperthermia, which can last up to several months following an acute traumatic injury to the, the spinal cord. So we know where the center of thermal regulation is, at least hopefully by now. Uh, and then when, when you have a rising core temperature, you get these efferent fibers within the autonomic nervous system that can cause a response with cutaneous vasodilation. And the whole process of sweating is supposed to help regulate your um, body temperature. Uh, when you have uh, some kind of exogenous pyrogens being involved in, in your whole mechanism, then you can see an increase with your hypothalamic temperature set point. So in general, you have these skin thermoreceptors that send up signals through the spinal cord to the hypothalamus. So as you can imagine, when you have any kind of compromise to the spinal cord, that whole mechanism doesn't work anymore. And so it leads to a lot of dysregulation with uh, uh, the body's temperature. When you have an acute injury to the spinal cord and you see a lot of blood products spilling into the spinal cord itself, that can potentially release a lot of free radicals. Glutamic acid can excite a lot of neurons. And all of this can also develop with uh, uh, neurogenic fevers. Interestingly enough, a lot of the consequences of the spina uh, spinal cord injury happen when there's a interruption at the level between T4 and T6, because that's where your major splanchnic sympathetic outflow is. Uh, and that can result in a lot of this autonomic dysregulation. So a complete lesion above the sympathetic outflow can lead to a lot more problems with regulating your body temperature. Um, there, there's some debate as to whether you have to have a cervical or thoracic cervical spine, uh, um, cer thoracic or cervical spinal cord lesion um, to cause a bigger incidence of neurogenic fever. But in general, if you have anywhere in the, thoras uh, the thoracic spine or the cervical spine, it can also have equal likelihood of causing neurogenic fever, uh, more so in general than a lumbar spinal cord. So I'm not sure we're able to do a study like this anymore, uh, but there's this guy Pollock uh, did this kind of uh, this study back in the 1950s where he had a bunch of patients with a spinal cord injury. He submerged them into a water bath of 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot, and he kept them there for 40 to 45 minutes. He did the same thing to a control group who had no spinal cord injury, same temperature, same amount of time, and the people with the SCI injuries had a core temperature rise of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but the control group only had a temperature increase of 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is some kind of distinction between the two. This all contrasts to an autonomic dysreflexia process, which can somehow manifest as an infectious process, but there, there is some difference. Um, also happens with a lesion above T6, uh, but you can get a lot more diverse uh, clinical signs and symptoms. And it usually happens when there's some kind of underlying process in place. There's constipation, bowel impaction, some other underlying infections, pressure ulcers, bladder distension, all that can happen with an autonomic dysreflexia. So, there's kind of a, a few big families now. So we talked about neoplastic fever, uh, central fever, and neurogenic fever. The other big category that I thought we should go into is, is uh, 
drug fever, which is something that we'll all see at some point in time. So same kind of uh, scenario. It really has to have an exclusion of everything else that can potentially cause an infection before we can say that it's related to a drug, uh, which is a problem because we tend to use a lot of money trying to work this up uh, just to say that it's related to a medication we gave the patient. Uh, so a drug fever itself is suspected when a fever isn't really related to any underlying infection or any other medical issue that can cause fevers. Uh, and the patient looks inappropriately well. So they have these high fevers, but they don't really seem sick. But they're on some kind of medication which could be causing this response. Uh, and if you really suspect a drug fever, and it's not really recommended that anyone do this, is if you suspect a drug fever, you take it out, the fevers improve, and then you decide, let me try this drug again. So you give the drug back to the patient, and they develop another fever. Usually a lot less time it takes for this fever to develop when you rechallenge them, and that kind of clinches the diagnosis of whether this is related to a drug or not. So, as we kind of said, there's a lot of consequences with the drug fever, uh, and actually, actually working it up. A lot of cost, a lot of exposure to antimicrobials, increased hospital stay, and a lot of extra testing which may not be necessary. <laughs> so there's a lot of different mechanisms. We won't go into all this because we really don't know yet as to all the different reasons as to why someone can have a drug fever. But with specific drugs, there are certain drugs that can have a shorter duration uh, of time before you, seeing a, you see a fever and some that may have a longer period of time. Um, antimicrobials uh, usually takes about medium of six days, average of 7.8, and antineoplastic drugs even shorter. Uh, however, there's a lot of other drugs that can take a lot longer to develop fevers. Uh, a lot of cardiovascular drugs can take uh, up to 44 days, uh, and central nervous system drugs can take about 18 days. So a drug fever, there's a different pattern of fevers that you can see with them. So of these, the one that you really have to pay attention to is a hectic fever, because that's the one that's most often seen. So it's a combination of intermittent and remitting fevers, really. Uh, and maybe as a result of us using a lot of antipyretics, cooling blankets, uh, things as such. But when you do have these fevers, they tend to be huge, um, going up to 104, up to 106. Uh, and, and that could be a very distinguishing feature for a drug fever. And like we said, these patients look inappropriately well. Uh, they, they have these high fevers, but they seem like they're just going about their day. Uh, they often don't know they're having fevers, and they may or may not have an associated hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, they could have a, a relative bradycardia, like the Faget sign that we all know of. Uh, there may or may not be any lab problems at all, but you could have them, so it tends to go 50-50, probably around that number. And there's no link between having drug allergies or atopic disease and the development of drug fever that's very definitive. So we can't even use that as a probability measure. So kind of going into these, these uh, uh, aspect of relative bradycardia, I thought this was interesting. How do we really calculate a relative bradycardia? We talk about it so much, but how do we really do it properly? So there's actually some work out there that helps us do that. In order to really calculate a relative bradycardia, you got to be an adult over 13 years of age. Well, not really an adult. Uh, a temperature of at least 100, 102, and you got to do it while uh, you measure your pulse while you actually check your temperature. You can't have any second, third degree heart block or pacemaker, uh, and you can't be on any medicine that can alter your heart rate. So if you have the, the temperatures you see here, you should expect to get a proportional uh, heart rate, and anything less than that is a relative bradycardia. But there's an easy way that you can do this and calculate it. So you take the last digit of your temperature. So for example, I put in 102. So the last digit of that is 2. Decrease it by 1, get 1. You multiply it by 10 and add that to 100. So you end up getting 110. So that's your proportional heart rate to that temperature. And anything less than that is a relative bradycardia. So you can kind of use that. It's a, it's a rough gauge as to whether someone actually has it or not. So thought it was interesting. You can do without what you want but we'll go back to drug fever. So there's a lot of drugs out there that potentially have this phenomenon. Unfortunately, in, in this field, a lot of these are antimicrobials of some kind. In fact, uh, probably a good quarter of it is up there. Uh, this is the most common phenomenon associated with hyper or, or drug fever, which is hypersensitivity. Uh, most common cause of fevers with drugs, 
and it's felt as though there's some kind of product with the drug that can serve as a haptin which binds to larger proteins become antigenic uh, and then they can respond with the host immune system to cause fevers uh, and that may be the whole phenomenon that you see with hypersensitivity uh, you could have some cell mediated mechanisms and um, unfortunately this could occur days after you even start the medication but again rechallenging the patient so let's say they had a drug fever five ten years ago and you feel as if it may be the drug everything else was excluded and let's say five years later you want to test this you give them the same drug again you should see a fever develop within essentially hours of giving the drug and the fever can be pretty significant the other mechanism behind the drug fever is you can get altered thermoregulatory mechanism uh, we can see this often with thyroid medications so levothyroxine increases the metabolic rate and therefore your temperature causing pyrexia. You get a lot of sympathomimetic agents, cocaine, amphetamines, MDMA, uh, which act directly on the hypothalamus. Uh, the MDMA also increases serotonin release. Uh, epinephrine promotes a peripheral vasoconstriction, no heat loss or less heat loss. You can get fevers with that uh, and a lot of anticholinergic drugs. Uh, you could have a drug administration related fever. So we can see this often with amphotericin B. Uh, there's a lot of pyrogenic activity uh, as you deliver the amphotericin B. It causes release of a lot of endogenous pyrogens which can cause fevers. Uh, and there could be a lot of phlebitis associated uh, with these drug fevers from irritating solutions. Oh, and the difference between this is that this can actually be seen a lot more quickly than other phenomenons with the drug fever. A lot of drug fevers can cause, be caused from a pharmacologic action of the drug, uh, and that's because of the way that these, these medications actually work. Uh, the gerish herxheimer reaction is one phenomenon. Uh, with, uh, we, we see it oftentimes with treating pyelonephritis or a lot of gram-negative rod bacteremias. You give them antibiotic, it's appropriate antibiotic therapy, but they can still develop fevers days after they are actually started on the, the antibiotics. And the whole concept of that is because when you're treating it, uh, they release a lot of lipopolysaccharides from a lot of these gram-negative rod organisms, and that itself can be very pyrogenic. Uh, you can have antineoplastic agents that release endogenous pyrogens after cellular destruction. Uh, we see a lot of the times with tumor, uh, uh, essentially necrosis, causing people uh, to have fevers. And anticoagulants, if there's any issue with bleeding, that can cause fevers too. There can be a lot of idiosyncratic reactions like malignant hyperthermia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, and also uh, problems with uh, inherent metabolism issues uh, like with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Uh, and going on that note, because we'll see it oftentimes when we, uh, for example, whenever we want to start someone on Dapsone, we, we tend to check uh, G6PD levels uh, to see if they're deficient. If we're suspecting someone to have this, uh, we can see whether that's the case or not by getting a peripheral smear. So this is one peripheral smear from, this is from the New England Journal. Uh, if you see spherocytes and dense red cells that are cells that are on their way to hemolysis and then you can see hemigosts and blister cells that are suggestive of oxidative hemolysis. So you can see that on a peripheral smear itself. The other way that you can kind of understand how this would work, uh, also from the, the same article, this is with uh, favism, so yeah, fava beans causing G6PD uh, uh, induced hemolysis. Uh, from, from deficiency of G6PD. Uh, so just to look at this a little more carefully because it is a small picture. So you have the pentose phosphate pathway and you have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Uh, it's a bold right up there uh, next to the blue. And that is responsible for causing a lot of, uh, producing a lot of the NADPH. And the NADPH helps uh, uh, renew a lot of the glutathione stores. And the glutathione stores help uh, prevent a lot of the uh, uh, essentially negate a lot of the reactive oxygen species that can be uh, caused by a lot of different mechanisms. So if you don't have uh, enough G6PD, you don't have enough NADPH, you don't have enough glutathione, and you have a lot more oxidative uh, damage from a lot of these reactive oxygen species. So that's one. And the other one is, is um, I, I found this article that was interesting. Uh, who this, is, this guy tries to find out what antibiotics are most commonly associated with drug fever. So in this particular study, uh, after all said and done, he found that uh, piperacillin compounds, like with Zosin, tend to have the, the highest association with drug fever, at least in this particular report. And when I was a, a resident, there was this guy who had a gunshot wound, was in the hospital for essentially about a month, 
and I was, I think, on call. He had a known allergy to Zosin, but no one really knew what that allergy was. Here I am just covering, so I had no idea what was going on with this guy. So someone had the bright idea of challenging him again with Zosin, uh, which I guess probably isn't the best thing to do when you have someone on call, and you might want to do it when you're actually there to see what happens. So I get a call from the nurse. It says, this guy's temperature is 106. So I said, really? It's 106? I, I, I didn't believe it. Like I thought she was just messing with me. So I go there, because technically what you're supposed to do, you can't, you can't pass this one off to just Tylenol if it's that high. So I go there. And the guy, she said, look, I'm checking his temperature, it's 106. I saw the thermometer, it's like, it really says 106. So I said, can we get a rectal temperature? Like, maybe that'll help. Rectal temperature is 107. <laughs> so I had no way around this. And I said, all right, just, you might as well just give him some Tylenol. He's awake with all this. And I said, let's, let's see how it responds. So I step away for like five minutes. And then she gives me a call, says, it's 108. I can't make this up. I, I got a call maybe a couple minutes later, says it's 108 now. So I said, all right, just get a whole bunch of ice packs, go ahead and put it under his armpits, put it in his groin, and then get a cooling blanket and put that over him. It says, and just go ahead and give him some ibuprofen on top of that, see if that works. So we do all of this. It didn't work either. So the temperature went to like 106 from 108. So the guy, though, he's just sitting there. He, he looks at me and says, why are we doing all this? I said, because you're, you're going to burn up. And I said, well... Okay, it's been a little, let's just go ahead and give him some rectal tinol and see if that helps. It did not help. So, at the end of the day, I just said, let's just go ahead and give him some Ativan. I gave him some Ativan. That temperature went down to like 101 in a matter of like minutes, which is just like a magic drug. So, that's my story. I'll never forget how Zosin can cause something like that. So, that's, that's kind of drug fever. That's a whole family of drug fevers that can cause these infections, these uh, mimicries. So, the last one, I promise, is the last one which hopefully we can make a diagnosis of, I have yet to do so, uh, is, is a patient with a periodic fever syndrome, which tends to be a lot cooler in, in being an infectious disease mimic. Uh, a lot of these conditions are managed by pediatricians because it's often diagnosed during childhood. Uh, and then if you're an adult with a new diagnosis, it tends to go to rheumatology. Uh, but I mean, there's no reason why we can't manage this. It's a it's a fever. Like that's that's what we do. So we should be able to handle it. Uh, so a periodic fever. And the big question is is how can you distinguish all other infections from a pedi periodic fever syndrome? Because that's what we really want to answer. Because if we can really say whether it's a mimic or not, we should be able to distinguish the two. A periodic fever tends to present with recurrent episodes of fever, and the the key word here is inflammation with no other cause. And it can go on for months or years, and you can have a wide variety of uh, systemic manifestations. You may or may not have inflammatory markers present, uh, and the, the key thing with the history is that this has begun since childhood. Uh, there are some rare episodes in which this can develop spontaneously during adulthood, but it's often during childhood. Ethnicity tends to be important here. Family history, uh, whether they have any associated signs or symptoms, and the duration of the fever tends to be key. So if they tell you that the fever is constant for hours, or if it's constant for days, that tends to help you find out, is this a periodic fever, and then what kind of periodic fever syndrome it is. So oftentimes, we have to begin considering the diagnosis when they have these fever episodes beginning since childhood and going into adulthood. Uh, and then you may have these spontaneous episodes that happen while you're older, um, and not younger, but it's it's less common, so we can't really go to that by, by default. And they can happen over months to years in the absence of any other cause. So in, in looking over somewhere, uh, some sources to find out how we can best approach this, I came across this from, and it's actually from up to date. So they, they separate a lot of the major periodic fever syndromes, and they distinguish them based on when you see it, what the inheritance pattern is, and like we said, how, off, how long the fevers uh, uh, manifest for, whether it's days, um, hours, or even potentially a week or more. A lot of these fever syndromes, one of the complications is amyloidosis. A lot of the recurrent inflammation causes development of a lot of amyloid, which can lead to uh, renal failure. So this is some more. I had to separate it into two slides because uh, it makes it easier to, to grasp. And there are some diagnostic criteria to... to um, help manage and come up with the um, 
particular diagnosis with these periodic fever syndromes. So it's a, a point-based system. And a lot of these, you don't need genetic testing. Uh, you just calculate the points, and if all the other sources for fever are excluded, you can make the diagnosis. We won't go over this right now, though. So the first of the major categories is familial Mediterranean fever. It's an auto-inflammatory syndrome, autosomal recessive, and uh, it's because of a mutation of the MEFV gene. Uh, pyrin regulates inflammation uh, by working with the inflammasome, and those with mutations have more IL-1 beta and IL-18. These fevers can last between one to three days, and that could be the only thing that happens, or you get that with a lot of other constitutional symptoms, uh, including um, arthralgias. Predominantly neutrophilic, and this one is the one that you have to worry about a lot with amyloidosis. Uh, it's very responsive to colchicine. TRAPS, tumor necrosis factor receptor associated periodic syndrome, I'm only going to say that once, is a mutation in the TNF receptor um, one domain, extracellular domain. Autosomal dominant, you get recurrent fevers that last for quite a bit of time, along with a lot of other symptoms, not provoked usually, but can happen with stressors. And you get a lot of serum amyloid A production, uh, which can cause uh, renal failure, potentially heart involvement, uh, and a lot of the uh, IL-6 uh, receptor inhibitors can be used in treating traps. Interestingly, infliximab has the opposite effect. It makes it worse, so just be careful with that. Hyperimmunoglobulin D in periodic fever syndrome is another one uh, with a mevalinate kinase problem. Uh, there's a loss of activity with that, essentially, uh, enzyme. Autosomal recessive. The way that works is a little unclear, by the way. And these fevers can last three to seven days. And this one, interestingly enough, a common trigger, stress, trauma, vaccinations, and viral infections can cause this to develop. Uh, and there's some thought that the enzyme itself loses a lot of its activity with a uh, rise in your temperature. Uh, up to date again also has an uh, interesting pathway. And we don't have to go all over all of this specifically. But the bottom line here is you don't need genetic testing to make this diagnosis. Uh, if you have these symptoms present with a increased uh, immunoglobulin D level, that's really all you need to diagnose it. This is another one, PFAPA, periodic fever with aptus, stomatitis, pharyngitis, and adenitis. Uh, you can see fevers lasting three to six days, but you get a lot of issues with aptus ulcerations, pharyngitis, uh, and lymphadenopathy. This may or may not have any long-term consequences. It just tends to disappear after a while. There's another family, cryoporin-associated periodic syndrome, uh, and it's related to a mutation in, in what you see up there, NLRP3CIAS1. Uh, and it's involving the cryopyrin protein, autosomal dominant. But there's three of them here. And I'm kind of hoping I see someone of this. I'm probably sh sure I'm not going to. But familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome. It happens when your whole body is exposed to the cold temperature. And usually you can see a baby born. As soon as it's put into the delivery room, it tends to be a cold room, they suddenly develop symptoms. So it happens like right away. Uh, and it happens within about well, about seven hours of actually exposure. You can get urticaria and fevers develop, uh, along with a lot of other problems. Uh, they may get a rash, and it has a neutrophilic predominance, uh, not a eosinophilic predominance. There's a muckle well syndrome, and the distinguishing character here is you get progressive sensorineural hearing loss. This neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease, we won't really see that if we're dealing with adults, but this is the most severe, and a lot of these kids die before they reach adulthood. Um, a lot of these conditions also can cause secondary amyloidosis. Uh, and I think that kind of does it. We went over a lot of different things that can mimic an infection. Uh, let me make sure. Yep, references. So in case anyone's interested, this is where uh, all of these sources come from. Uh, and that's about it.